The school of thought that you're referring to doesn't seem to deign to publish its ideas in the ordinary peer-reviewed press for the very good reason that they probably would not get published. Um, the school of thought themselves take the view that this is uh, discrimination against them. Others take the view that their papers would not be worth publishing and therefore would not pass muster in the standard um, gauntlet of peer review. The idea that's being proposed is that certain features of cellular physiology, like the bacterial flagellum, are what's been called irreducibly complex, which means that they must have been made by a divine designer. The form of the logic is like this. I, the individual writing the paper, writing the book, am personally unable to think of a way in which <laughs> the bacterial flagellum might have arisen by gradual degrees. Therefore, I declare by fiat that it is irreducibly complex. Therefore, God must have done it. Hodgkin and Huxley worked many years ago and got the Nobel Prize for it on the, how the nerve impulse is propagated along nerves, along axons. It was a very hard piece of work involving very difficult mathematics, and they worked and worked, and they solved it, and they got the Nobel Prize. Imagine the following dialogue. I say, Huxley, <laughs> The nerve impulse is a really difficult problem. I can't see how it's done. No, Hodgkin. I agree, it really is hard. And I can't face trying to solve all those differential equations. Let's just write a paper to Nature saying the nerve impulse is too difficult. We don't understand how it was done. Therefore, it must propagate along the axon by divine impulsion. <laughs> the research strategy of these so-called intelligent design people is lazy and defeatist and not part of the scientific method. The scientific method is to say we have a problem, it is difficult, we can't see the solution at present, so let's work harder at finding out what it is. It's such a privilege to understand where we come from, a privilege that's granted to those of us who live after 1859, uh, that to deny children that privilege is wicked. Uh, it's um, a deprivation which should not be visited on any child when the truth is so staggeringly exciting. It really is an enormously exciting thought that we are cousins of all living creatures, that we have a history of four billion years of slow, gradual evolution. Just think about four billion years of slow, gradual history. That's not something we can easily take on board. But the effort of doing so is well worth it. It's such a, a beautiful thought that we are the heirs of four billion years of evil, maybe 3.5 billion years of evolution, and that we are cousins of all living things. When you put that against the measly, piddling little ideas that are in Genesis, it's just no comparison. And it's a, a sad and diminishing deprivation of a child's opportunities to be denied that knowledge. Imagine you are a teacher of recent history and your lessons on 20th century Europe are boycotted, heckled, or otherwise disrupted by well-organized, well-financed, and p politically muscular groups of Holocaust deniers. Holocaust deniers really exist. They are vocal, superficially plausible, and adept at seeming learned. They are supported by the president of at least one currently powerful state, and they include at least one bishop of the Roman Catholic Church. 
Imagine that as a teacher of European history, you're continually faced with belligerent demands to teach the controversy and to give equal time to the alternative theory that the Holocaust never happened, but was invented by a bunch of Zionist fabricators. Fashionably relativist intellectuals chime in to insist that there is no absolute truth. Whether the Holocaust happened is a matter of personal belief. All points of view are equally valid and should be equally respected. The plight of many science teachers today is not less dire. When they attempt to expound the central and guiding principle of biology, when they honestly place the living world in its historical context, which means evolution, when they explore and explain the very nature of life itself, they are harried and stymied, hassled and bullied, even threatened with loss of their jobs. At the very least, their time is wasted at every turn. They're likely to receive menacing letters from parents and to have to endure the sarcastic smirks and close-folded arms of brainwashed children. They are supplied with state-approved textbooks that have had the word evolution systematically expunged or bowdlerized into change over time. Once we were tempted to laugh this kind of thing off as a peculiarly American phenomenon. Teachers in Britain and Europe now face the same problems, partly because of American influence, but more significantly because of the growing Islamic presence in the classroom, abetted by the official commitment to multiculturalism and the terror of being thought racist. The, the belief that dinosaurs are only 3,000 years old and uh, that the, the universe is only 6,000 years old, how to give an idea of the real time span um, of the world, when what, one way to put it, which I've recently been think, thinking about, is that if somebody believes that the world is only 6,000 years old, or of the order of a few thousand years old, when the true age of the Earth is um, of the order of a few billion years old, that means they're out by a factor of a million. Um, <laughs> which is not a trivial error. Uh, it's, I mean, I, I am not very good at, at, uh, at arithmetic, and I calculated that it's equivalent to believing that the distance from New York to San Francisco is 700 yards. <laughs> uh, but I received a letter from um, a, ma a mathematician who'd done, his, done the sum again, and he said I got it wrong it's actually equivalent to believing that the distance from New York to San Francisco is 28 feet. <laughs> um, either way, it gives you an idea of the scale of the error. Uh, the questioner asked what would uh, the um, people of Liberty University have to do in order to demonstrate that these d dinosaur fossils really were 3,000 years old. Well, what they would have to do is to find igneous rocks which uh, were found in proximity to or sandwiching the, the fossils and date these by radioactive dating. Several different, half a dozen at least, different forms of radioactive dating, all of which give independent estimates of the date of these fossils. And all those different methods of doing it should point to an age of 3,000 years. In fact, of course, what they, those uh, methods of dating all show is that dinosaur fossils are hundreds of millions, well, no less than 65 million years old. Not just one method of radioactive dating, lots and lots of different methods of radioactive dating, different clocks, clocks working on completely different principles that, that all point to the same order of magnitude of age of these dinosaur fossils. If it's really true that the museum at Liberty University has uh, dinosaur fossils which are labeled as being 3,000 years old, then that is an educational disgrace. <laughs> it is debauching the whole idea of a university 
And I would strongly encourage any members of Liberty University who may be here to leave and go to a proper university. <laughs> <laughs>